all about fish. There are relatively few living things that have managed the transition from the deep to dry land. Even today, most organisms still live in water, the cradle of all life. And everything that does not live in a marine environment still needs water for many metabolic processes. Fishing, whether it be in rivers, lakes, or in the sea, especially along coastlines, has, since the beginning of time, been one of man's main ways of getting food. Early in the morning, fishermen go out to sea in their boats, no matter what the weather, to heave in the fish they've netted. Even when the fish are out of the nets, the work is far from over. Sorting, gutting, washing, and packing in ice are also part of the fisherman's life, as well as cleaning the nets and boats. After unloading his catch and selling it, either directly or through an intermediary, the hard-working fisherman's efforts finally pay. To work the rich fishing grounds well away from the coast, stern fishing boats such as these have been in use since the end of the 50s. Refrigerator trawlers, the most modern fishing vessels in the world, can stay at sea all year round to follow large schools of fish, such as cod, herring, and ocean perch. Fishing vessels vary. For fishing from the high seas or in a previously fixed depth of water, a dragnet is always used. With a length of 50 meters, a width of 30 meters, and a depth of 6 meters, the net drags its catch through the sea for some 4 to 5 hours before it's pulled on board. Long gone are the days when bulging nets were pulled from the sea. Fishing quotas limiting a catch are certainly not the only reason. The fish are sorted, sometimes filleted, and packed in ice on the spot. That is the only way they will satisfy the most stringent demands, the demands of the customer. The high protein content of fish, vitamins A, B, B2, niacin, and C, as well as its many mineral salts, especially iodine and phosphorus, make this source of food more and more popular for its nutritional value. This is where the most abundant fishing grounds are found. Cod, haddock, coalfish, herring, plaice, and flounder are caught in the North Sea. From the Baltic comes the popular Bornholm salmon, much lighter in color than its Canadian counterpart. Fishing grounds near Greenland and Ireland are also popular. The fish are stored in ice-filled boxes and then classified by experts into different categories. This is how they're presented in enormous fish holes for examination by prospective buyers. It is here, immediately upon unloading, that the fish are inspected to see if they are fit for consumption. Only impeccable fish of the highest quality are permitted by the medical experts and health inspectors to be sold. The auction is characterized by tension for all concerned since only now will the fishermen know whether the catch is profitable. Romantic ideas of enchanting sunrises are illusory for the fishermen at work, since technology is not yet an important factor in the lake fisherman's life. Once the catch is made, the nets, painstakingly laid out the night before, are laboriously pulled in. Long and thin, with a pointed nose, glinting like silver with a bluish or greenish back. These are the hallmarks of a carregonus. Laid fresh in ice, it's known as whitefish from Lake Luzerne. Elsewhere, it's also called polan or vendace. On fish farms, millions of eggs are brooded over and hatched under constant movement until the baby fish have reached this stage. Then they're placed in breeding ponds where their growth is stimulated by good feeding methods. Fish farming, or pisciculture, was practiced by the Chinese for centuries. Today it gives us a wide variety of choice. Pike, trout, carp, perch pike, salmon and grayling, to name but a few. Another way to catch fish is angling. This is the most demanding method because no nets or creels are used.
Imported fish are checked by the health inspector in special loading bays like this one in Basel. Sometimes they're examined in a laboratory. Without the health inspector's seal of approval, the fish cannot be transported farther. However, once the go-ahead is given, box upon box is loaded up, classified by destination. Even then, the eye continues to probe, and the nose too, as the health inspector remains vigilant. Some 80 to 100 tons of the most varied fish, from shark to pike, in other words, from freshwater to saltwater fish, are transferred in only one and a half hours. In general, fresh fish, for example, for Switzerland, come from Holland, Denmark, Norway, England, and even Greenland. But there are also special fish from the Mediterranean. The competent health inspector ensures that when such fish are dispatched, whether it be in wood, cardboard, or polystyrene, there is enough crushed ice to keep the fish chilled. Box upon box is reassembled and duly labeled. A buzz of activity reigns in the loading bay and the empty pallets are stacked meters high. Loaded up again, the fish travel on by road or rail to their destination. Barely has the consignment arrived, and the fish are unloaded by the retailer, because more often than not, the customer is already waiting for delivery. Even so, random tests are essential even here as one can see with this fine red mullet. There is an enormous international variety of fish on offer to satisfy the needs of any specialist. That is why the growing popularity of fish on today's menu continues to rise. However, crustaceans including freshwater crayfish are equal to fish. In well-organized specialist outlets, where quality, prompt delivery, and service are taken for granted, the telephone never stops ringing. Order upon order is taken and filled immediately. In such an environment, fish enthusiasts and dedicated executive chefs alike must feel like they're in utopia. Even Hans Rudolf Treichler, a poet and master in the cooking of fish, wants to find out what's on offer in such fish strongholds. Fish after fish is examined and tested, for he uses only the best for his daily revised fish menu. Lobster and crayfish, spiny lobster, such as these priceless delicacies that they are, will inspire the talents of any fish chef worthy of the name. Buying the right produce, fresh and of first quality of course, is essential for every good fish cuisine. Hans Rudolf Treichler demonstrates the signs of fresh fish. The eyes are bulging, clear, and shiny. The gills are firm and mostly light red in color. The flesh is firm as well and gives when pressed, but then goes straight back to its original state. The scales cling tightly to the skin, and the fish exudes a general odor of freshness. Immediately upon arrival, the fish are separated into freshwater and saltwater fish. They are also classified as to shape, round fish with two fillets and flat fish with four fillets. Size and shape of the mouth, as well as the teeth, depend on what the fish eats. A difference is made between plankton eating and flesh eating fish. To determine a particular type of fish, the different fins, the shape of the body, and the markings are the differentiating characteristics. The fresher the fish, the fuller its taste. An excellent reason to have one's own fish tank. An adequate water flow, an abundant air supply, a temperature between 9 and 12 degrees centigrade, 
and weekly cleaning are minimum requirements. Nowadays, even lobsters and crayfish, or spiny lobster, are found in special saltwater fish tanks in many restaurants. The correct temperature for lobsters or oysters, which are put in special baskets, is 5 degrees centigrade, whereas for crayfish, it's about 12 to 16 degrees centigrade. Food preservation prevents all catches of fish from going bad. About 10% of all fish caught throughout the world are canned. To make grotted lox, another form of preservation is used, marination. Fresh sides of salmon are filleted and boned. Norwegian or Canadian bred salmon are preferred because of their distinctive color. A marinade is carefully prepared. It's composed of a mixture of sugar, salt, crushed peppercorns, coriander, various dried and fresh herbs, such as dill, chives, thyme, or burnet. Every executive chef or garde manger has his own recipe. The marinade then is spread evenly over the fillet. A few bouquets of dill which give salmon its special touch are spread over it. This simple preservation method, which in no way affects the special flavor of salmon, should also spur you on to making your own gravid lox. After only about 18 hours in the refrigerator, the fish is ready to serve. For its presentation, you can give free rein to your creativity and imagination. Dressed fish, such as roll mops, cannot be kept very long in marinade. Either they're pasteurized at a maximum of 85 degrees centigrade, or as a semi-preserved product, heated to 110 degrees centigrade. Salt acts hygroscopically and thus preserves the fish. Salt cod is simply dried codfish. Salted and dried, they're sold as bacalao. In the beginning, fish to be smoked were hung in chimneys. Nowadays, there are two ways of going about it. Fast, hot smoking at about 80 to 100 degrees centigrade in heavy smoke. Whether a fish is good for smoking or not depends on its fat content. The more fat it has, the more suitable it is for smoking. With smoking, not only is the water removed from the fish, but its taste is also improved. International specialities best suited for this hot smoking method are whitefish, herring, trout, and mackerel. The enduring favorite among smoked fish is salmon. Whatever the season, fresh or deep frozen, it is filleted with a practiced hand. Known throughout the world as number one for its quality is the Bornholm salmon. Bornholm salmon has a very high fat content, which gives its taste an unsurpassed finesse and tenderness. After filleting, the salmon sides are sprinkled with salt and stored for one to two days, depending on size. They're soaked overnight in water and then cleaned. They are hung up side by side on special hooks and then wrapped in the intestinal skin of beef. This prevents the fish from tearing during slow, cold smoking at up to about 30 degrees centigrade over one to two days. Salmon sides like these are the pride of any master smoke dryer. Since this fish delicacy is not the exclusive domain of restaurants and hotels, experienced hands must do the trimming and cutting on the spot, something which chefs would do elsewhere. There is very little wastage thanks to precise cutting with sharp knives and incredibly long experience. Even specialists are amazed to see such expertise. The skin is removed in seconds by the machine. Whole sides of halibut are vacuum packed. However, one must remember 
that vacuum packing alone is not a method of preservation, unless it's done in conjunction with freezing or deep freezing. Thanks to today's special ovens, warm, even tastier fish can be served as an appetizer. A little sawdust is sprinkled over the hot surface, then a few juniper berries and two pine twigs are added to refine the smoked taste. Whether it be herring, whitefish, or trout, the marinated fish are carefully laid on top. For a delicious and highly esteemed delicacy, Hans Rudolf Treichler suggests smoking crustaceans. This exquisite, extraordinary speciality can be served after only five to seven minutes. A freshly smoked fish. Fishing seasons are mostly concentrated into a few months of the year. And even then, fishing often cannot take place because of adverse weather conditions. In order to have access to fish all year round, deep freezing is required. Real deep freezing is carried out at minus 40 to minus 60 degrees centigrade. A storage temperature of minus 18 to minus 20 degrees centigrade should never be interrupted until final use. Even the largest fish, like the sturgeon, can be stored several months in this way. The best known and most economical method of preservation for a few days is chilling. Temperature of minus 18 to minus 20 degrees centigrade should never be interrupted until final use. Even the largest fish, like the sturgeon, can be stored several months in this way. The best known and most economical method of preservation for a few days is chilling. The fish are laid on crushed ice in special gastronorm drawers or perforated containers from which the melting ice can flow away. The fish should be placed belly down. Only in this way can the water drain away and all the taste, odor, vitamins and mineral salts be preserved. A thin film of plastic is laid on top. Cloth must not be used because it contravenes public health regulations. Ice again is placed on top, and the consignment is stored in the fish fridge at about zero degrees centigrade. The ice should be changed at least every two days. Here again are all the preservation methods used for fish. Smoking, salting, marinating, heating, chilling, deep freezing, and drying. Like vodka and Crimean sparkling wine, caviar is a typical product of the Soviet Union. Astrakhan, the historic city on the Volga, and Guriev are the main trading centers on the Caspian Sea. Real caviar comes from the following three types of sturgeon. The beluga, weighing on average 350 to 450 kilograms, though some magnificent specimens reach 1,200 kilograms. The ossiter, which can weigh as much as 200 kilograms. The savruga, which is the smallest sturgeon and seldom weighs more than 20 kilograms. Before packing, the roe is sifted, cleaned, rinsed, and slightly salted. The whole process from the removal of the caviar to canning it takes at most 10 minutes so that the product can remain fresh. The fresh caviar is shipped in leaded crates, the ideal storage temperature being minus 3 degrees centigrade. The original can with a net weight of about 1.8 kilograms sometimes shows where the caviar came from, for example, Astrakhan. They are sealed with a rubber ring. For the connoisseur, the hand-etched Russian script on the side of the can is particularly important, for it authenticates the especially expensive contents within. The Russian B for Ossiter, one O, two O's or three O's for Beluga, and C for Sevruga. 
From the original cans, which always carry the same design, a sturgeon in a blue circle and the word caviar in a half circle above it, smaller cans of 50 to 500 grams are carefully filled. With caviar, the grain should be glassy, full-bodied and dry, not salty or even bitter, and of a regular size and color. Gleaming nicely and resting gently grain upon grain is how this greatly sought-after delicacy should be presented. The color of the lid is typical of pasteurized caviar in jars. The inscription Malosol indicates a mildly salted caviar of the finest, highest quality. Other parts of the sturgeon which can be used in cooking are isinglass and the spinal marrow of the sturgeon known the world over as vasica. The name caviar is in fact used for the roe of any fish. There's a trout caviar colored black or yellow, lumpfish eggs known as German caviar, or the large roe of the dog salmon with its characteristic pink color. However, the most sought after and exclusive remains sturgeon caviar. Served on its own as an appetizer, it's a delight. And served this way, on ice with a mother of pearl or ivory spoon. Not only a delight for the palate, but also a feast for the eyes. A small sample to taste. And now, it can be served. A great variety of garnishings can be offered. What goes best with toast are butter, chopped eggs with the white and the yolk separated, and perhaps a little lemon. Connoisseurs will always refuse onions because they take away the caviar's delicate flavor. The idea that light gray caviar is better than dark gray is a common fallacy. The color is merely an indication of the fish's pigmentation. The only elements that determine quality are the pure taste, a pearl-like grain, and above all, the mild saltiness.